political cartoonists. The worst of the worst. The only people deserving of less respect than YouTubers. I'm deeply broken, and I stare into the abyss of political cartoons more than I care to admit. There are no standards when it comes to these goddamn things. They aren't just boring caricatures of local politicians like you might expect. They are the hateful scrawls of some of the weirdest, angriest people on the entire internet. Looking over this absolute dreck, this horrible dog shit, we are forced to ponder one simple question. Who is the worst of the worst? Where is the bottom of this barrel? Now, maybe you're familiar with one or two of the names on this list. You probably know of Ben Garrison, the libertarian turned Trump sycophant with an obsession with butts. The guy who draws Trump as a golden god, a superhero. The man who labels everything he draws because he's so afraid you won't recognize the thing that he has drawn in front of you. Perhaps some of you reflexively said his name in response to the question, who is the worst political cartoonist? And if you did, you do not understand the direness of this situation. That's like saying that an elephant is the biggest thing in the solar system. Elephants are big, sure, but there are certainly bigger things. And just like elephants are eclipsed by continents, moons, planets, the sun itself, so too is Ben Garrison's incompetence dwarfed by the incompetence of his peers. While I was writing this, it got announced that Ben Garrison got COVID, so in the event that he dies before I get a chance to uh, release this video, that's very funny. It's very funny that the man died. I mean, obviously, I hope he doesn't. I'm not gonna cry about it. Ben Garrison is one of the better political cartoonists working today, and I can think of no greater indictment of the art form than that. When we look at Ben Garrison's work, I want you to keep in mind it's all downhill from here. Firstly, Ben is a talented draftsman. Not like incredibly talented, he has some weird issues with perspective to be sure, but he's pretty good. His cartoons are fun to look at, they manage to convey a message visually, even if he doesn't trust you to understand that message without labels. They're colorful, dynamic, and the characters are usually pretty recognizable. Obviously. He's not without his flaws. He does not understand Don Quixote, for one. He often portrays characters tilting at windmills as valiant, heroic underdogs. He is powerfully horny. You can really feel the sexual repression in any comic in which a woman appears. He loves drawing big old butts, and there's nothing wrong with drawing big old butts. If you want to draw me with a big old butt, I encourage you to do so. Flood my inbox with drawings of me with a big old butt. What makes this a flaw is that Ben's proclivity for plump posteriors often gets in the way of the message he's trying to send. Like, for example, this comic where Mother Nature is spanking Greta Thunberg and just... Whoa! Ah, oh, Benny boy really living up to the libertarian stereotypes here with this image. Think that's bad? Let's look at the works of A.F. Bronco. Remember when I said Ben Garrison was a talented draftsman? Probably some of you out there may have scoffed at that. Allow me to lower that bar for you. Just, just get it nice and low. A.F. Bronco makes comics that look like this. Just scribbling furiously over the faces of bad politicians, covering their faces in wrinkles and blemishes, so you know that they're evil because it manifests on their faces. He often has characters holding little signs so that you know what their political beliefs are supposed to be, like they're just walking around town, or in most cases just like a black and white void holding signs, positioning their body in such a way that their arms look four inches long, like everybody's got little T-Rex arms. Even the good guys in his comics end up being kind of hateful caricatures, scowling with little caveman foreheads. This is how Bronco chooses to depict people he relates to. To give you an idea of the man behind the cartoons, Bronco signs his comics with his name and a URL where you can go to find more of his comics. For a long time, that URL was comicallyincorrect.com. His intention being, I suppose, to highlight that he was not being politically correct and using comics to do so, but, you know, also kind of directly saying that, like, he's so wrong that it's really funny. In the corner of all of his comics, for years. Bronco is the conservative id, so it shouldn't be a big surprise that a big lefty soy boy like me would dislike his comics. I would never apply the same kind of critique to, say, a leftist radical comics artist, or, say, a self-appointed leftist radical comics artist. 
Behold, Ted Roll, the world's only true revolutionary. Ted is a true gift in that he can make a point in a comic that you agree with, but you want to tell him to shut the fuck up anyway. Shut up, Ted. Just shut the fuck up. The man has a massive superiority complex. Take a look at this comic where, upon the death of Roger Ebert, he takes the time to explain how Ebert wasn't that smart, because unlike super genius Ted Roll, he was impressed by Citizen Kane, of all things. This hack fraud, who represented the hollow sentimentality and arrogant exceptionalism that composed the nasty side of the American character, couldn't understand Ted Rawls' unprecedented insight that Citizen Kane is boring. Probably the reason that Ebert didn't understand that Citizen Kane is boring is because Roger Ebert was lacking in curiosity and sophistication. That's probably what happened in that conversation. Oh, you read Dostoevsky? Fool that you are, for his works are boring to me. If only you were able to see that, but alas, few are blessed with my insight. In Rawls' world, he is the last reasonable man, beset upon from all sides by people who are itching to support some super Hitler. He begs the world to see reason, and everyone reacts with immediate hostility. Why, oh why, can nobody recognize his genius? Why do people continue to heap praise on hacks like Art Spiegelman, the guy who made Mouse, when, the, when that praise belongs to Ted Rawl. Ted Rawl is the only one talking about drones. He put drones in a comic. Obama used drones, and Ted Rawl put it in a comic. You can't compete with that kind of vision. Where's his Pulitzer? Speaking of Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonists, this is Michael Ramirez, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. And while he's actually a very skilled artist, you'd never know it based on the shit he turns out nowadays. His work is stylized into oblivion, with completely unrecognizable characters. This one is Obama, by the way. Can you guess who this one is? Just take it, take a minute and guess. And then we zoom out. That's, that's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Is that what you guessed? He just, he takes a drawing and then applies this digital cross-hatching filter just all over it and it makes it look like total ass in print. Look at this glorious insight. The police are the only thing holding back feral, animalistic criminals. <coughs> Except the police also have dogs that do routinely attack people, so kind of feels like the message is the police are violent criminals, which is probably not what social conservative Ramirez intended. Ramirez, shall we say, struggles to construct a visual metaphor. Like, take a look at this. I'm sure he meant that Obama is, a, is destroying the dam that holds back illegal immigration, but the dam itself is labeled illegal immigration, and Obama is destroying that. So is Obama destroying illegal immigration? Incidentally, Ramirez fucking loves little Dutch boy metaphors, just fucking loves them. And he also likes taking a big thing and labeling it debt because of all of the debt. You see, there's a lot of it, so visually, it's like a big thing, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. But this is not a video about who is a bad or over-celebrated cartoonist. We are looking for the worst cartoonist, the worst art, the worst ideas, something lacking in jokes or creativity of any kind, something so hateful, ugly, and utterly devoid of any talent or skill that nobody would expect it to be internationally syndicated, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen and envies. May I present to you Dry Bones by Yakov Kirshen, a comic so inexplicably terrible that it's difficult to believe it's genuine. Where to fucking begin with this one? First of all, the artwork is horribly lazy. Just the same orange sweatered guy over and over with the same sloppy mistakes. His eyes almost always bisect one another, seemingly because Kirshen doesn't bother to erase it. It happens so often that I'm sure if pressed, He'd defend that as part of his style, but it's not at all consistent. He doesn't always do it. Sometimes the <laughs> artwork is just a photo he hastily ran through some filter. Like nobody was going to notice he did that. Sometimes he'll put artwork next to a photo with no thought or care put into connecting the two images. There are often gaps in the coloring because Kirshen just uses the fill tool and doesn't notice when he makes those gaps. Sometimes those gaps are in the text, implying he put the text down first and then colored around the text with the fill tool. Now, if you don't use Photoshop, that might not mean much to you. Let me explain to you the, the levels of incompetence that had to go into making a mistake like that. Text, by default, in almost every image editing software on Earth, places itself on a new layer that shouldn't affect the fill tool used on other layers. In fact, you typically wouldn't be able to use the fill tool at all on a text layer because text is saved as a vector. So nothing other than text 
should be able to go on that layer unless you specifically chose to rasterize that layer. This heavily implies that Kirshen was using MS Paint to make these cartoons, because in MS Paint, there's only one layer that everything goes on, meaning you can reproduce this error pretty easily. So rather than simply color it first, then put the text down, he instead put the text down, colored around the text, then didn't notice when there were gaps anywhere where there was like an enclosed area and a letter. No forethought, no planning put into what's going to go on this page. Just slap it down, shit it out. Though in fairness, his newer cartoons make extremely piss poor use of gradients and airbrushes that wouldn't be available in MS Paint, so maybe he switched it up. And, and just look at the way his dialogue flows here. What is really disturbing is that the international community seems less worried about Iran threatening to destroy Israel and more worried about the possibility of Israel stopping Iran from doing so. He just slapped the text over two panels with no care whatsoever for how it read. The only thing he drew was his self-insert character, Mr. Scholdig, looking at a newspaper. This comic is from 13 years ago. Let's see how Kirshen has evolved his craft since then. And now for the grand reveal, the prestige. This man has been a continuously published cartoonist for almost 50 years. But as we've seen, being bad at your job isn't all that special in the field of political cartoons. Kirshen may be bafflingly bad at his job, but that alone wouldn't be enough to bother me. There are two things which set dry bones apart in a field brimming with hacks and frauds. One, the absolutely single-minded approach he takes to defending Israel from any and all criticism, labeling anyone who isn't sufficiently Zionist in his mind, celebrities, companies, and politicians, up to and including members of the fucking Likud party, an anti-Semite, and in many in many cases, fake, bad Jews. He presents Palestinians as bloodthirsty monsters, and the whole world as aligned against plucky little Israel for no other reason than an all-consuming anti-Semitism that trumps any and all other political concerns. And two, the urgency with which he requests his readers' money. Dry Bones has a pretty diverse revenue stream. He accepts PayPal donations, makes merchandise, and gets published in the Jerusalem Post. But he does some other stuff, too, that goes from relatively benign, like pushing his Haggadah every year when we're getting close to Passover, to kinda scummy, like claiming that a tax-deductible donation to his comics helps fight anti-Semitism, to outright hilarious, like this Iron Dome mug, one of the 42 discreet mugs available on the Dry Bone store. He always draws Israeli war machines with smiley faces on them, by the way. Yeah, sure, he might blow up some kids, but he's got a big smile so you know it's a good guy. My personal favorite of his fundraising endeavors, by the way, is the Dry Bones Academy, where you can learn from master craftsman Yaakov Kirshen himself how to create powerful and meaningful cartoons for political advocacy. You too can create images as stirring and convincing as this one. Or this one. You should pay to learn how to make those. I think it's actually disgusting the way Kirshen manipulates his audience. Oh, hey Grumbletum. Ooh, you're not looking so good, buddy. This is Grumbletum, the folksy woodland critter that eats my likes, comments, subscriptions, and Patreon donations, and will absolutely die painfully if he does not receive enough. Boy, he looks pretty sick. I'm really worried about him. Just to be safe, just in case, Boy, you better hit that like button. Better comment and subscribe and give me money on Patreon. I mean, it's not for me. It's not for me. It's not for me. It's for him. I submit to you that Yaakov Kirshen is the worst political cartoonist working today. The absolute bottom of the barrel. Terrible in every capacity to be terrible. Bigoted, poorly drawn and written, lazy beyond belief, and inexplicably successful and esteemed. A true perfect storm of a bad political cartoon, and proof that the medium is beyond salvation. The goal of any cartoon should be to catch the eye. What a lot of cartoonists seem to miss, however, is that that's impossible because the eye will catch you. Hello and welcome to the Eyeball Zone. Here in the Eyeball Zone, we use the fill tool to enclose small creators who need eyeballs on their works. In Combating Caribbean Homophobia, ellipsis, even my own, Foreign Man in a Foreign Land examines the way queerness is looked at in Caribbean culture, and how his own views and way of speaking about the subject have evolved. What I love about this video is that it isn't simply that he presents a straightforward and sincere apology that educates the audience without equivocating about his prior mistakes, but it also grapples with a pretty thorny subject. 
When you're fighting to preserve your culture, what do you do when there are elements of that culture you'd like to change? How do you remain both authentic to your own history and your own values? How do you talk about problematic aspects of your culture without giving ammunition to those that would like to undermine it? It's a question that I think a lot of people might reflexively dismiss, but it's treated here with the level of nuance and care that I think it deserves. This is a gutsy video in the spirit of kindness and respect that is sorely lacking in many spaces online. Do you have a small leftist project you'd like to see here in the eyeball zone? Send no more than one email to thoughtslime editor at gmail.com with the word eyeball somewhere in the description and pertinent details like your pronouns, and perhaps you will find yourself trapped here in the eyeball zone.